Welcome to episode 88 of Think Big with Michael Zellner. All positive, no politics. My guest today is Don Turner. Don is the chairman, co-founder, and CEO for Neosinus Health based in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. He is a board member for the University of North Carolina Center for the Business of Health. He got his undergrad at Worcester Polytech Institute in Applied Physics and Advanced Mathematics. And Don received the CEO Monthly Magazine's 2021 Global CEO Award in Healthcare for Best Drug Development Platform. Thanks for joining me today, Don. Thank you so much for the opportunity. My pleasure. Tell us something interesting about yourself that most people don't know. Oh, trick question, so to speak. Um, so most people would not know that. Um, so I began my career um, as a as a carpenter building homes. So I went to uh, trade school, uh, built two homes while I was in trade school, and then uh, joined a crew and, and ran a small crew, built, uh, or I think, around 24 homes from start to finish. So 26 homes from start to finish uh, built. This is up in Boston, where my uh, funny accent's from. And then uh, we'll call it collateral damage, so to speak. Uh, the other thing that people are not going to know is that uh, uh, one day uh, after a long evening of working, um, I had a, a nail gun, 180 pounds of pressure, three and a half inch steel spike with spikes on it and glue and uh, bam, right into my knee all the way in. Uh, and it was stuck in there for uh, over eight hours. Um, oh, and so, yeah, so that was uh, that was my... Uh, my uh, my war story, so to speak, for a carpentry. But yeah, most people certainly wouldn't know I was a carpenter at the beginning of my career. And very few people would know that that injury occurred uh, as I was doing it. So are you fully recovered from it? It was uh, I, I am. But it's funny. Sometimes I'll have a little weird walk or a limp or something, uh, usually when it's raining or some other something else is kind of kicking me off. And um, and that's definitely a result of that. So. You know, you talked about you grew up in Boston. I know you were really young when your parents passed away. It sounds like you took over as the leader of your family because you worked, you know, 50 plus hours a week while you were in high school. Uh, yeah. How were you able to do all that, handle that kind of pressure at such a young age? I, you know, I think uh, as many people have gone through, again, far more than I have, you know, in, in the end, you just have to do it, right? Um, sometimes you don't have even time to think about it. Um, you know, you're your opportunity at that point is, is really to just go right into it, um, take over and, and do as much as you can, as best you can, you know, to get through life. And I think that's just naturally what happened. I mean, it, it's, it was a difficult thing to go through. Uh, you know, I lost my, my um, first dad when I was um, nine years old on Christmas Eve to lung and brain cancer. My mother ultimately remarried, uh, lost my stepdad to lung and brain cancer. So two in a row, um, my, mom, my, my mom had gone through a lot, you know, as I was going through high school. So she, for three, almost four years, had a nervous breakdown, crawled on the floor, couldn't leave the house. And so, you know, they were quite frankly, too proud to take government assistance at the time. And so I had to just step up and, and make money for the family. So I worked from uh, 3 p.m. to 11 at night, uh, sometimes midnight plus weekends. And, and I just did it. Um, and I never looked back. I didn't look at it as a negative. I just looked at it as, oh, this is just naturally what you need to do, right? Left foot, right foot, and left and right. That's just what you do to walk. And this is just what I did to survive. And again, there's millions of people, if not billions of people that have done something very similar. You just have to, to do what you need to do to get through life. You know, you're, you're a guy who has persevered despite, you know, big so obstacles early on in life and talking about, you know, losing, your, you know, your both your dad and stepdad and your mom having the nervous breakdown. You worked many hours, but you also, you had a learning disability and, and you had, you know, teachers tell you that you never would be able to go all the way and get through college. Now, tell us a little bit about, you know, why they told you this and what you went through to overcome everything. Uh, well, I think there's two reasons that I was dealing with what I was dealing. One is because I did have both a speech impediment, uh, and now you can't shut me up. Uh, you, you'll soon you'll soon learn that. Um, and I had uh, dyslexia, and I had um, reading challenges as well. And so you know I was brought out to a separate trailer uh, in in uh, elementary school. You, you know you wouldn't do that nowadays. We're all integrated, but at the time I was brought out with the handicapped children, um, and you know I was treated as as you know mentally handicapped. Um, and so I, I just had that just because of me personally, what I was going through. And then, you know, as I was growing up, um, 
no doubt because of what I was going through. I, I think I was a pretty angry person, you know, call it acting out at the world. And so, you know, I got into, you know, into some rough groups and, and into some trouble here and there and um, got really distracted. Again, me probably just trying to survive in life. And so my focus, unfortunately, at the time was not school. It was working 50 hours a week and and just mentally trying to survive as best as I could. And so, you know, when I wanted to get on a different track, um, you know, I wasn't fully equipped, quite frankly. I didn't have the educational underpinning to do that. Um, I approached a, a guidance counsel and a teacher and I asked them for some guidance and they they literally both shut me down and said, you know, there are some people who can go to school um, and you're not one of them, right? And and I think that, A, I wouldn't have done that, right? So they were right. literally pu pushing me down and holding me back. But there was certainly some truth to what they were saying in that it wasn't going to be easy for me. You know, on the surface, I wasn't equipped. Um, I hadn't proven myself to be able to do that, right? Uh, it's almost like, um, yeah, I don't know if I've ever seen Don swim. Hey, can you can you compete against Michael Phelps? Uh, I'm not sure how well that's going to go, right? Because you, on the surface, you're thinking, I don't think I've actually seen him swim before, right? right. Um, but that doesn't mean someone can't swim. It doesn't mean that actually they may not be a better swimmer than Michael Phelps at some point, right? So there's there's a pot of truth in that. But there's a part of what I'll call simply oppression in that, uh, and certainly lacking motivation, right, and guidance and support. And these are people that, you know, quite frankly, they they should have they weren't my enemies. They weren't intentionally trying to hold me down. Um, they just had, I guess, no faith, and they had no uh, intent and motivation to try to help me. And so, you know, fortunately, I'm naturally a, a fighter. And so, when you tell me I can't do something, I'm literally going to do it. And so. You know, I think it was me just saying, screw you. I mean, screw all of you, right? <laughs> and right. so screw my handicap, screw everything else. But I think the other thing is, and and I talk about this a lot, is it's it's really perspective. Um, and that is some people may view just a simple example, my dyslexia as a handicap. I actually view it as an asset. And, and I'm not just saying that to sugarcoat it. I literally believe it's an asset, right? And so if in my business, I talk about a you know, not a, you know neurological, um, you know, complexities of the brain. Um, you know, I can pretty much keep up with most doctors. Um, none of those terms are easy. None of the concepts are easy. I spend an exorbitant amount of time. I'll listen to podcasts. I'll watch YouTubes. I'll read papers. Um, you know, I, I have dyslexia so bad. I mean, I always joke, I, I can't even spell a, a, a letter correctly, right? I've got it so bad. And so what I don't do is just like people that aren't challenged with that, just serial, just process it all the way through, right? I like parallel track and triangulate into this thing because I, I have to readjust, segment, separate, connect this dot, connect that dot. And I believe that because I'm actually going through all that, you know, kind of triangulation and effort and having to put the extra effort in, it actually makes a big difference. I think it's conceptually when they say, if you're trying to study something, say it, you know, read it, you know, write it. Um, and it's just, it's cementing in uh, and reinforcing concepts in a variety of different ways. And so I believe that's happening because of my handicap, so to speak, my my weakness, so to speak, whatever you want to call it, label it. But again, I view it as, as an asset, right? Um, and so I think it was me just having that perspective, me having the fighter mentality that says, screw you, I'm going to actually do it. And then, you know, once I saw my capacity uh, intellectually, I was, you know, taught my class, um, you know, taking courses like, you know, above calculus five, uh, linear algebra, differential equations, um, advanced mathematics. Uh, these were courses that people said, I, I couldn't even take high school mathematics. You just, you're not good at math. So don't go to engineering school. You can't do math, right? And I'm taking these courses that typically require three semesters over a year and a half. I take them all at the same time to challenge myself. It was, it was me just leaning in further and further and further into what I was recognizing as, again, not only an asset, but a, but a capacity and a potential and a capability that I personally had never seen. And that was very exciting to me. And that's why I always tell people, don't let anybody judge you. Don't let anybody give you a label. Nobody knows you. You're going to be surrounded. In, in you and I talked about this before the podcast, right? I mean, there's just, we're surrounded by a lot of people that just, they're at odds. They don't want to speak positively. 
Um, they're working against one another. Um, you know, they're, <laughs> you know, they're a bunch of naysayers. Uh, in some cases, they want you to fail. It's like, listen, forget them all. I mean, I just, I literally have blinders. Um, you could sit here after this show and say, Don, what you just said was the stupidest thing that I have ever heard. Well, that's good. Good for you. I mean, I don't care. I literally don't care. Um, if I had a panel of a hundred doctors on the other side of this, and I explained what we're doing at NeoSinus, and they said, I don't know about that, Don. I'm not sure if that makes sense. I literally don't care. And that's going to sound pretty crazy because what we're doing is something that's going to revolutionize and optimize the way in which drugs are delivered to the human body, particularly the brain. And so who, who am I? Uh, you know, I'm not taking a medical class in my life. So who am I that would have any confidence in saying what I'm saying? It's because I spoke to enough other people that are out of the box thinkers that actually see the big picture uh, that said, you guys are actually onto something like I've never seen before. And oh, by the way, and this is my fighter mentality, right, is there are many conversations I've had with, these are MD, MD, PhD combinations, and they're challenging what we're doing. And I push back 100%. And actually, I actually tell them straight up, you're actually wrong. And let me explain to you why you're wrong. You're wrong because you've always been thinking this way. And guess what? <laughs> it now works this way. And, and, you know, you were so fixated on, you know, maybe stacking boxes uh, and, you know, round boxes don't stack well. And you just kept trying another type of material for that round ball. And it's another type of round ball. And I'm like, wait a minute. What if you built a square box? Like, I know it's different. It's like nothing you've ever seen before. It's not round. But I don't think it needs to be round. I think it needs to be square. And then I bet we can stack it, right? And it's like thinking outside the box. And I've been on many of those calls with lots of doctors like that where I push back. At the beginning, I was doing it to validate because I would actually explain why I felt I was right. No joke. And part of me was like, I wonder what they're going to say, right? <laughs> Maybe I am wrong, right? Um, I wasn't. I, we weren't wrong, right? And so after seeing that over and over and over again, it, it helped us recognize that we're actually on to something great. But again, all this comes to just persevering, not giving up, believing in yourself, not letting people around you tell it, say it's not possible. If they don't support you, that's their problem. That's literally their problem. That is not my problem. If you don't want to be part of this great opportunity, then go somewhere else. It's a big world. Good luck. Um, and, and you've got to have that mindset. And, and it's, it's a careful balance, right? Because you don't want to be so ignorant that it, it, I'll flip it. You don't want to be so ignorant that you keep trying to stack these round balls over and over and over again. That, that's ignorance. Right. What I'm saying is that if, if, if you believe and you've validated that, that vision and that theory uh, and you've proven that theory, if people don't believe it, that's, that's okay. Keep going. And particularly, particularly if what we're talking about is to improve the human condition. There are, Billions of people who are suffering in this world. It's incredibly sad, right? Depression, anxiety, PTSD, neurological disorders, Parkinson's, dementia, uh, you know, uh, epilepsy, seizure. I mean, on and on. If you look at the 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 mental health and neurological challenges that exist in the world, um, it's hugely debilitating. Uh, and it's and and as near and dear, if you will, that cancer is to me. Um, if you take cancer. My surrogate uh, grandparents, who were really my parents, one died complications from cardiology, another one died from complications of diabetes. So you take cancer, diabetes, cardiology, you stack those up, and they don't even remotely, they get a lot of attention, as they should. But in terms of the, the, the uh, health and economic impact that those three contribute, pales in comparison to the contribution collectively of neurological and mental health disorder. So if what you have has the potential to improve the human condition in a multitude of different ways, it's it's hard. I mean, I'm again, you're going to see the passion come out. It's hard to, you know, if you're like, Don, you got to remain calm. You can't get excited about what you're talking about. You know, I just couldn't listen to you. I mean, it just because I get so excited and we all get so excited about what we're doing and it's that passion and it's that drive and it's that tenacity that I love to see in my team and all the people that we're working with because they see something that's great. And when you have that and you start building upon that and you add to that mass, it just makes it easier and easier and easier to just ignore all the naysayers. So 
uh, you know, uh, maybe a long-winded way. See, you see, see my speech impediment? You can't shut me up. <laughs> a long-winded way of answering the why, but there was a lot of sure. why thing threaded in there. You know, and I've always been taught, you know, growing up in sales and marketing, enthusiasm is contagious. And so that enthusiasm that you have, I'm sure that, you know, follows on to your team and the people around you. So that that's wonderful. And that's what they need because you got to be excited about what you're doing for sure. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's, um, uh, you know, I, I saw a post on LinkedIn the other day and um, it was someone who was joining a group and it was a mental health group. And, and she's like, listen, you know, I'm not professionally trained uh, at all in mental health. I don't really know a lot about mental health but I am extremely passionate about trying to make a difference because my family members and my friends have all suffered. And I literally posted to her and said, listen, that enthusiasm gets you 90% of the way there. It really, really does because that's the, that's the energy. That's the momentum. That's the fuel, right. That allows you to just persevere and drive and actually do something and make a difference. So it really begins there. You know, you certainly showed the skeptical teachers, you know, didn't you? You went on to not only undergrad at Worcester, but you also then attended MIT, were in advanced studies on molecular medicine there, and then you got your MBA from at Emory University in Atlanta. It's, you know, obviously you were in school a really long time. Did you just like school that much, or was obviously there just a much bigger plan in mind? No, it was a bigger plan. And just for clarity on the MIT, these are the open courseware, which I think they do a phenomenal job. I didn't get a formal degree from there, right. but, I, but I took all the classes and, and uh, you know, quite frankly, I think a lot of my basis of understanding of what we're doing is because of that. And again, I just think what they're doing with that open courseware is phenomenal. It's a perfect example that if you don't have the capacity to go to school, if you don't have the ability to go to school, if you don't really maybe have the access, so to speak, to go to school, it's right there. It's called the internet. And I think most people have access to the internet, broadband, uh, you know, phones, you know, wh what have you. There's a lot of amazing content that's out there that you can use to, to strengthen yourself, to educate yourself, to enable yourself to fulfill whatever mission uh, and, and mantra and folk you have, um, it's there. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I was, it was so funny, you know, when people were like, you know, so how did you, so how did you plot where you're going? And, you know, and I tell everybody, listen, there's no plotting here. Like maybe a few people in their lives have plotted stuff, but, you know, um, and, and I get that, um, generally, um, but not always the case. This is key, right? You know, 20 years ago, if you were a doctor, Medical school in a box, boop, locked, right? Law school, long-term, boop, in a box, right? There are no boxes. There are no boundaries. You want to go from a doctor and you want to found it, you know, you be a founder of a company, do it. You're a lawyer. You want to stop law and you, you want to be a founder of a company, do it, right? You've, you've, you know, you've dug ditches for 30 years and you want to go to medical school, do it, right? And so there, there are no limitations, right? There are no boundaries. And so... I think in the end, it's all about um, doing things that you get excited about and wherever it goes, it goes, right? You know, I could never have envisioned me, you know, hammering in a board on a house when I was 19 years old. And then, oh my goodness, you know, 30 years later, I'm going to be on a podcast with, with Michael Zellner talking about, you know, revolutionizing, you know, you know, mental health and neurological disorders uh, and overall brain health and wellness. I mean, no one could ever connect those dots, right? And and I didn't sit there and say, this is where I'm going to end up. I had no clue whatsoever. I mean, I for me, it was a very, I'm a very calculated risk taker. Uh, maybe too much of a risk taker. Sometimes my wife will argue, right? But I'm a very calculated risk taker. And, and it's not just leap over the edge and then, oh, what is this over here, right? It was like, you know, it's like, wait a minute, let me look around. Okay, yeah, there's a ledge. Uh, but it looks like there's a green pasture over there. Uh, if I fall, I may twist my ankle, but I think I'm going to be okay and leap. I'll leap. I mean, I don't know what's there, but there's a level of calculation. And so throughout my career, you know, there were a lot of what I'll say opportunities that I saw that I would embrace and I would, I would go right into it. I mean, you know, simple example, uh, you know, 27, 28 years ago, um, at uh, it was the Analytic Sciences Corporation that evolved into Litton Industries and Northrop Grumman, and um, this was in a, in a tech group. And uh, I was working the the help uh, help desk. I actually started at the help desk, delivering PCs to people. Uh, and um, it was a great opportunity for me. Um, 
but you know, one day I was, I was walking, uh, walking to my car and one of the guys running advanced R and D programs for the Intel community asked me, Hey, can, we're trying to build a website. And this was even before websites were there. This is, this was 94, right? 95, way, way, way back. And he's like, Hey, we got to build this website with some, you know, scripting capabilities. You, can you do that for me? I'm like, yeah, I got it. But, you know, next week we'll work on it. Yeah. Like no joke. I, I couldn't even spell script. I literally had no idea what they were even talking about. And so, but what I knew, what I calculated was that, Hmm, I've seen a little bit of this web thing. I've seen a little bit of the HTML stuff. Uh, I saw some books on Perl programming. It, let's see. It's, Thursday. Uh, so I have four days till, you know, Monday and Tuesday. I'm pretty sure I could figure this out. And sure enough, I, I, I figured it out. Right. And I would do that. And then it developed, you know, went from there to now running advanced R&D programs to, you know, being a chief technology officer, running a bunch of software developers and on and on. Right. But it was, it was those little, what I'll call, you know, opportunity pathways that um, in my career, I would look at and say, wow, um, Let's do it and see what happens, right? Um, the other thing I try to encourage people is, is don't judge a book, if you will. Don't judge the op opportunity by the cover, right? And, and let me give you a very, very specific example. So, so um, the second major corporation I work with, it was by far the, the, the most um, memorable, awesome, cultural, professional, educational experience in my entire career, hands down, I've been doing this for 30 years, is Millennium Pharmaceuticals. They were the granddaddies of precision medicine, uh, had the largest proteomics and genomics databases. This is all, you know, let's let's look at the human genome and instead of just one pill for the mass population, can we understand the human genome, the DNA, you know, these single nucleotide polymorphisms, deviate, you know, deviations and va variations mutations in a genetic structure and can we design a drug that's specifically tailored for that particular predisposition for either a particular illness or in response to the drug that causes maybe some side effects and, and really create precision medicine that produces precision health right and so that was the, that was the, the the grand vision and so um so you know <laughs> that company, you know, this is up in Cambridge. I mean um, first of all the founders were were legends in the field Mach Levin uh, is is to me one of the greatest humans that have ever been on this earth. Um, just this quintessential leader, a visionary. Um, you know, he, he he took taxi cabs all over Boston. Didn't have his own car. Um, you know, you see him on the street corner talking to street people, and the guy's worth tens and tens and maybe probably hundreds of millions of dollars at this point. But it wasn't about that. It was about making a difference. You know, in the world. And, and he was very, very focused on the culture. And I can tell you that particular company, I've been around a really lot smarter people, right? I was on the advisory board for Cisco Systems, you know, just absolute, you know, top tier genius people. Northrop Grumman, advanced R&D programs, you know, these guys had multiple PhDs from top schools, MIT and beyond. Um, IBM Watson, same thing, just, you know, just large brains everywhere. I'd say Millennium was probably one of those companies that had just this amazing mix of massive intellect, but just so much diversity. It was it was unbelievable, right? So you know, it was a <clears throat> we're going into a, a meeting one time, and and this particular individual was a was a very accomplished scientist, and then he transitioned into the technology group. It was a very accomplished technologist and visionary, right? That that's pretty substantial transition. We're walking into the, the meeting room and we're waiting as the meetings, you know, opening up and he's on the, it was, a, we had grand pianos everywhere, right? And he starts playing like this Beethoven, uh, you know, classical music that, and I'm thinking, is that one of those fake, you know, pianos that just plays itself? He was actually a classical musician as well. It's just, and, and there were thousands of these people. It was crazy, crazy, right? So I would always say I was often the dumbest guy in the room, right? And so, um, so I was recruited for Northrop Grumman. I had you know, run advanced R&D programs. I had a you know, very strong, you know, track record of success behind me. I came into Millennium Pharmaceuticals as a strategy, business technology strategy type of a role. And so we were entering into biologics manufacturing, um, very transformative space at the time. And so we were in a 
a, a offsite uh, facility uh, for a couple of days. And so the person who hired me in from Northrop Grumman, you know, said, hey, Don, can you come in and just take notes? I'm like, sure, love to do it, right? And so let's stop right there, right? So I'm a pretty senior role, um, had accomplished a lot of my career. And someone said to me, would you like to go off site and take notes? I am. On the surface, most people would be like, I'm not taking notes. Yeah. I, I've proven myself. I'm accomplished. Like, why would I take a note, right, uh, for these people, right? I loved that. I jumped right in because I, in my mind, it's like, hey, you never know where it's going to end up, right? I'm going to learn a lot. Let's just do it, right? So we're going around the table. And um, this is this is in between the Harvard MIT campus. I know I can't say Harvard properly, right? But Harvard MIT campus. <laughs> and um, so, you know, around this table was, you know, Dr. You know, Dr. Blot, right? You know, internationally renowned this, internationally renowned that, next one, next one. They all looked exactly the same. I mean, their Rolodexes were like 18. I mean, their, their CVs, you know, were 18 feet long, internationally renowned, thought leaders in the space. I mean, just, just giants in the field. And it, boom, 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 all around. And it got to me, it was Don Turner, note taker. That was literally, that was my introduction, Don Turner, note taker, right? And so right there, you'd be like, what a waste of time. And if you stop right there and you said, who is the least qualified in the room? Like who has the least value in that room? Like hands down, 100% of the people anywhere in the world would say Turner, like, get, you know, you don't have enough room and you know, you got to get rid of one, get rid of Turner. Like he is the least valuable. Guess what? Fast forward to noon. The most valuable person in the room was actually me. And here's why, because we started to break up into groups. And my job, and this person knows I was very good at this, my job was to kind of immerse myself in the groups, take notes, conceptualize what they're doing, next one, next one, next one, next one. And then they asked me to stand up and present my observations. And what I did was I connected in a way where they actually said, man, thank goodness you brought him in because none of us would have had individually been able to draw this visualization this abstraction, these connections, it would have been literally impossible. Thank goodness we brought Turner in, so to speak, right? And so we went from, you know, the least qualified to the most qualified. And it was the person that you thought really wasn't doing anything very exciting. And that's why I say, don't, don't judge a, a, an opportunity by its cover. Go into it with an open mind. Worst case, worst case is unless you believe you know everything um you may you may at the end of that meeting maybe you didn't learn anything but there are lots of situations where i went into a meeting that i was literally the thought leader like i technically i would know more than everyone in the room and i learned each and every time so if you're entering something that's outside of your realm of expertise um i can almost assure you you're going to exit with a with a newfound knowledge insight perspective that you never had before. So I'm a big, big fan of, of you know, being a calculator risk taker, leaning into opportunities, going in with an open mind, and just taking from it whatever it may be. I've been on many calls where, you know, I'm, I'm the business guy, right? So I'm always trying to advance, commercialize, create deals, build deals, build partnerships. There are many calls I'll be on. And if you just listen to the call, you're like, that was a waste of time. It isn't a waste of time. Trust me. <laughs> at, at this point in time, it may feel like a waste of time, but you never know. And I can give you thousands of examples of where that particular point in time that felt like nothing, that seemed like nothing, ended up being something very, very, very substantial. So you simply don't know. You don't know how these paths are going to cross. You don't know what type of dependencies and interdependencies are going to build. You know, You don't know what bridge you're going to have to cross to get there. Um, and so I really, uh, again, am a, am a big fan of leaning in, open mind, even if felt like it's not, if it feels like it's not going to be anything, or if it felt like it was nothing, even when you're done, just kind of pocket back there, put it off to your side, put it in your, your chest of, of assets and life experiences. And some will fade, some will go, some will elevate, some will shrink, some will drop. But you, you're going to be surprised. The things you didn't think were valuable may be valuable. The things you thought were incredibly valuable may not be so valuable. That's just life, right? So experience life, 
lean into it, have a good time, but definitely. And again, I feel like this is somewhat trite because you hear it all the time, but to the extent that you can, and not everybody can do this, unfortunately, but to the extent that you can try to do something that you love with some passion. And I would have opportunities where I would do that on the side, but it's what I love to do. I got so much from it. I mean, a simple example is, is um, <clears throat> for 14 years, and this to me was one of the greatest experiences I've had. For 14 years, I was a patient care attendant for a ventilator dependent quadriplegic. It was a good friend of mine in high school. He uh, experienced a tragic accident when he was 17 years of age. Um, a superhuman being. I mean, he was voted best looking, uh, most uh, most athletic, uh, nicest smile, you know, it just on and on. He was just loved, um, you know, five, four, and he could dunk a basketball. That's a pretty big wow. deal, right? Yeah. I weighed up, he never weighed more than 150 pounds and could bench uh, 450. I mean, unbelievable. like he was literally a superhuman, right? He looked beautiful. He was beautiful. He had everything. And he went from that to dying two times to the hospital after he broke his neck um, and then being in a wheelchair where he was just ahead, right? He couldn't eat. I had to feed him. He couldn't change himself. I had to change himself. Um, and yet every day he was so, so positive. People would ask him. Uh, his name was Eric James Rybicki, EJR. We call him Edja for short. Sure. And they'd say, hey, Edja, um, like, why are you so happy? And he would look at him like utterly confused. He would be like, like, what do you mean? They're like, well, I mean, you know, your situation He's like, and he was not joking. He was, he was confused because he said, listen, you would always say this. There are children and at this time. He's uh, I don't know, 19, right? 19, 22 years of age. Um, he's like, listen, yeah, there are children who are dying. I'm healthy, right? I'm good. There are people who can't see and hear. I have all those senses, right? I'm pretty damn lucky. He would literally consider himself lucky, right? And so I took care of him through high school, through college, um, and um, when I was in corporate, 14 years. And it was the best experience I had because I learned so much about life and perspective. And this was this was a this was a side gig, right? I'm, I'm working, I don't know, 20, 30 hours a week in the evenings and weekends. Um, I did it because I, I loved him like a brother. And I got so, you know, it's like, oh, you, you help him so much. Well, yeah, I mean, technically, you, know, you check the boxes, I'm helping him, but he's helping me. He's helping me have a different perspective on life. He's having, he's helping me appreciate what I have. And he's helping me realize that when I think I'm having a bad day in the grand scheme of things, not to diminish when people have bad days, but probably not the same bad day that I thought it was, right? With a different perspective. And so that's a perfect example of a side gig that, you know, was I loving everything I was doing in corporate? I mean, Good days, bad days, ups, down, you know, all over the place, like a roller coaster, right? Um, there were days I'm sure I, I disliked what I was doing, but I love that, right? And so find something that you love, hour a week, hour a month. It doesn't matter how much, but you, I feel like you need that dosing, right? You need that dosing of perspective, that dosing of happiness, that dosing of motivation that just keeps you going, keeps the perspective going, gets you happy, um, gives you something back, you know, however you define it. it doesn't, it doesn't always have to be compensation, right? It's not, you know, I know the world revolves around money, but it doesn't always have to be that. In fact, you can easily argue that, you know, money is the root of all, all uh, unhappiness and, and evil. Um, and it certainly doesn't. We've seen it in Hollywood's a perfect example. You know, we'll just stop there, right? <laughs> money doesn't guarantee, you know, happiness and fulfillment at all. Uh, and I think we've all seen that. And so just find something you love to do. And I think on a personal level, on a mental health level, on a psychological, on an emotional level, that ROI would be just so huge. You know, you asked the question, quote, do you know anyone that is suffering from depression, anxiety, PTSD, chronic pain, diabetic neuropathy, or other mental and health neurolog neurological disorders? Yeah. Unquote. You know, I would probably say that you know most adults would probably have to answer the, uh, yes to that question. You know, yeah. what do you say to them about what neosinus health is, is going to be able to do to help with all those situations? Yeah, well, I, I appreciate the opportunity. Again, the, my passion will most likely come out of this in, in about two seconds. So. Here's how I describe who we are. So we are a, a drug development platform company. We've recently uh, entered the pathway, I will call it. Uh, this is the first time I'm really speaking about this publicly. Little elements of this on my LinkedIn profile, but 
we're now on a pathway to launching a new division called Neopath Wellness, and that'll release by the end of the year, soft launch, and then really take off at the beginning of the year. So I'm going to end up talking about Neosinus and Neopath Wellness interchangeably a little bit. Um, but, the, but the grand vision is this. So we're a, a platform company that has built a revolutionary drug delivery platform that can optimize how drugs are delivered to the human body and particularly the brain. Um, and when I say optimize, it's both the effectiveness of delivering that drug and the elimination of side effects and the bypassing of a lot of impedance. So let me describe this because it's really important. And some people may know this, some people may not. When I describe it, they'll be like, oh, so that explains why there's all the micro font with all these side effects on the bottle. Oh, that explains why we have all these illnesses uh, in mental health and neurological disorders, i.e. brain illnesses that have no treatments out there. So everything I'm gonna describe will explain everything I just said, right? And so 66% of drugs that are taken are taken orally. And that makes sense, right? Because it's easy. It's, you know, people don't like IVs or needles, right? Yeah. They like a pop a pill, M&M, self-administration, do it at home, you're kind of done, right? Makes sense. Here's the problem. Well, first of all, we can even step back before you put the pill in your mouth. When you go through a clinical study, most people understand this. When you go through a clinical study, it's a fulcrum. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to balance more outcomes, positive outcomes, while also diminishing the side effects, right? And so the easiest way to illustrate this is if I gave you a tenth of an aspirin, you'd be like, mm, works a little bit, not so much, right? And I give you one aspirin, you're like, yeah, actually worked pretty good. And I give you 10 and you start experiencing side effects. But I get to lower it, right? And I lower it back down to the one. 10th didn't do anything, 10x did too much, I lower it to the one, right? And so at that point, it's called the maximum tolerated dose. And it's not just for you or for Don Turner, it's for the entire population. Remember, there's massive variation and predispositions to particular side effects. And, and I may take five and have no problem, you could take two and have lots of side effects. And so that drug, it's like the least common denominator of math. We're back to math again here, right? But you actually find that the least common, uh, you know, maximum tolerated dose that, that is allowed, and then you fix the drug onto that. And so the reality is that for many people, say that I could actually take five, it's already a diminished dose. It's already a weakened dose. So that pill before you even put it in your mouth is already impeded, like hands down. And you put it in your mouth. Well, the first place it goes as it travels your body is your liver. And it's called the first pass effect. And it's your liver enzymes degrading that drug up to 75 plus percent. And so that drug that's already been impeded before you put it in your mouth now is taken orally. Remember, two thirds of drugs are like this. It goes through your liver and up to 75, in some cases more, percent of that drug is, is degraded, is broken down because of the liver enzymes. Now, it starts to circulate through your body. It's called systemic circulation. It's basically in your blood. And that drug is now circulating throughout your system through all your major organs. This is also true for IV, needle, transdermal patch, any other modality uh, of drug delivery with the exception of intranasal uh, in your nose, which we'll talk about in a minute, is going to exclusively, and that's why those, those drugs that... Um, modality for delivery is called 100% bioavailability. That's what percentage of the drug is in the blood. By definition, the, ne the needle is in your bloodstream, right? The IV is in your bloodstream. So of course, 100% of the drug is in your blood. That blood is circulating through all your major organs. And so guess what? If that drug is destined for your brain, which is true for mental health and neurological disorders, you're causing collateral damage as you go. You're not, you're not trying to target any of those you're just, you're taking that pathway because now that's where that drug is now circulating, right? So it's already been weakened before it gets into your body. It's weakened up to 75 plus percent by first pass liver enzymes. It's now being exposed to all your major organs. And there are some great drugs that uh, had great potential, but they failed, not because the drug was bad, but because all the organs were exposed to the drug, even if it wasn't a target area in your body physiologically for that given drug. But because that was the pathway you took, you had side effects and the clinical studies failed. Incredibly sad. Now, if I just stopped there, you'd be like, wow, what an absolute disaster. Well, guess what? That's nothing. It is something. But what I'm going to tell you is 
the greatest barrier that far exceeds everything I just described. And that's called the blood brain barrier. So think of it as a shield around your brain. Your brain, your body is so profound. Right? I mean, it's just, it's, 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 I get so mesmerized when, when, and so many people do, right? When you think about the human body and its capacity and capability, it's just, it's so profound, right? Well, the, the body, the, the brain knows that that organ is so important. You got to kind of shield yourself, right? And so that blood brain barrier blocks 98 to 100% inclusive of almost all compounds that don't belong in the brain cannot bypass that blood brain barrier. And that, that is a massive impedance for delivering drugs to the brain beyond what I've already described. So even if you were lucky enough to get through there, because a little, you know, okay, there were only two or three side effects. I guess that's better than 30, right? Uh, and then you get up to the, to the gate of the brain and then bam, you hit a hard wall, right? And again, there are many, many drugs that are in that 100% category. It literally cannot get through. Well, here's the great news. And this is, this is what we're on. And now I wanna be super clear. We did not discover this. You know, great scientific minds like Dr. Fry out of the Health Partners Neuroscience Center in, in Minneapolis, He's one of many, but he's considered the granddaddy of this discovery of, of not one, two, three, four, but five pathways to the brain that have nothing to do with what I just described, has nothing to do with the liver, has nothing to do with systemic circulation, has nothing to do with blood-brain barrier. It is a direct pathway. There are certain regions in the nose, and if you understand the anatomy and you understand physiology, and if you understand physics, that always throws people off. But if you understand physics, you can actually design a device that is anatomically designed to very comfortably go in your nose. I can, I, the nozzle, I can literally put it all the way up into my nose. It can go right there. No discomfort. Children have used it. Uh, elderly have used it um, because it's anatomically designed based on the anatomy of the nose, which is incredibly complex. If you understand that anatomy and our scientific advisory boards, top rhinologist in the world, Dr. Rice from USC, the other two founders are, are highly accomplished with I think uh, 55, almost 60 years of experience, ear, nose and throat. Um, so they know the anatomy better than, than anyone. If you understand the anatomy, you can design a device that can actually get comfortably into the key area of the, the nose to then target that drug to the certain areas of the nose that provide those direct pathways. So again, there are five direct pathways in your nose. If you can, if you can reach them, that they will provide a direct pathway to your brain that bypasses everything we have to say. And so here's how I will often describe the uh, blood brain barrier. And some people will be like, well, um, there are certain drugs that bypass it. Well, they do, but it's also really inefficient and really complex and sometimes it doesn't even work well enough, right? And, and again, I use these abstractions, these, these weird analogies sometimes, but think of, uh, I don't know if, if, I think most people have, have been aware of this, you know, in, in around um, Halloween, you see a cornfield, a corn maze, right? So it's a big cornfield right. and you have this crazy maze of zigzags everywhere, right? And you have a, you have a, you know, in, inlet and you have an exit point. And your goal is to get through this crazy maze with these tall stalks and you're trying to, and you have no field division and you, and everything looks the same because it looks like corn and you, and you sometimes will get trapped in there, but there is a way in and there is a way out. Well, listen, are there some drugs that can go through the blood brain barrier? Sure. Just like they can go through that corn maze. But if you kind of step back and say, wait a minute, isn't there a better way? What if I just walk around the maze? Can I get to the other side, right? And so that's what we've done, right? Um, you know, is we've realized that you can get through the brain in some cases, but it's really uh, not optimized. It's really complicated. Or we can take these alternative pathways directly to the brain. Now, here's the magic is once you're able to do that, you can then fully optimize um, and exceed and overcome all these bar barriers that have hampered and, and prevented some high potential drugs from getting through clinical studies. And, and even when they've been approved, they're just not working like they should, or there's some really negative side effects, or the side effects feel really painful and you just simply don't wanna take the drug. And, and there are thousands and thousands of examples of that. But the great news is we have the platform 
that will allow drugs, uh, whether they've been patented or not, this is huge. Because of the way that we've designed the device and patented the device, we can take drugs that have been off patent for decades. Just so you know, when drugs are off patent, most pharmaceutical companies run from that because they've lost patent protection and exclusivity. We can reclaim that because hmm. we can take that drug, we can combine it with a device, the device is patented and now we've reclaimed exclusivity. There's only one way to do it, our device, uh, and it's fully patented, right? And so as a result of that, there are drugs, I'm not gonna name them because it's very proprietary, but many doctors would know this. There are drugs that have been around 50 years, 75 years. One example is 100 years. And that drug that's been around 100 years that have been in tens of millions of people, small children take it, elderly take it, tens of millions of people take it every single day of their life, has been clinically shown to reverse Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, traumatic brain. One simple example. And that drug has been out there for 100 years. But they're so worried, you know, and, and they're running from the the off-patent challenges, we can now embrace that. So we can literally sit here and cherry pick drugs that have been approved by the FDA, that have been in humans for decades, have been fully vetted in a real world environment, not just a clinical study. And we can combine those with a device and we can transform the way in which those drugs work to ultimately address neurological and mental health disorders. Same thing, what's called nanoparticle system. So. Um, these are, you know, you think of drug as the, the active pharmaceutical ingredient. That drug is what's hitting the target in your body to make you feel better, right, in simple terms. Well, these things called nanoparticle systems, which is really just chemical structures, right? It, it, it's, it's not the active pharmaceutical ingredient. It is not making you better. You take the drug and you take this, which is not making you better, but you're using this nanoparticle system to actually overcome all the barriers I described before. Like, oh, really difficult to go through the liver. I wonder if we can use the power of chemistry to encapsulate it. Uh, you know, these hydrogel capsules and we can encapsulate it. So it can get through the liver without too much loss. And they've been trying to do that for decades and decades. And then, oh my God, we don't want to expose that drug to some of those organs. So we'll encapsulate that with nanoparticle systems. And then imagine if we can somehow use that to try to overcome the blood brain barrier. So everything I just described has been done for decades, and it's all about those physiological uh, impedances, right? Well, guess what? <laughs> They're irrelevant to us, right? But not only are they irrelevant to us, but once we get up into the nose, those nanoparticle systems that really are focused on improving the absorption and distribution of the drug, when it gets to the point of administration, administration is your mouth. Boop. Okay, once it gets in, Absorption distribution improves. Oop, needle, point of administration. Oop, once it gets in, absorption and distribution improves. Well, guess what? When you're in the nose, unless you can hit those target regions, which are direct pathways, those nanoparticle systems are useless because there is no point of administration. You haven't hit the target region. So the administration, the absorption and distribution has no value whatsoever. So there's a whole host just like there are amazing drugs that have been sitting here for decades that have great potential and no one's touching them, we can touch them and we can use them and we can transform mental health neurology. Same thing as nanoparticle systems, just, just like the drug, just because they may fail, it's not because they failed because they don't have potential, it's because of all these impedance. But if we take that technology, we incorporate it with a best in class drug. Now you have the best in class drug that's been proven safe and effective, if it could just get there more effectively. And you think these nanoparticle systems that have always been designed to further improve the optimization, but boy, you gotta get to where that point of administration is and you combine it with our intranasal delivery platform, all of a sudden you have what I call the end-to-end -end platform to be able to optimize the effectiveness of those drugs while also, very, very important, eliminating the side effects. So Neopath Wellness, is a division of Neosinus Health. Neopath Wellness is a telehealth-based uh, service model that's going to take these, these FDA-approved FDA off-patent drugs uh, that have been used for many, many decades, combine them with our device to optimize the effectiveness of how they're delivered to the body by also eliminating the side effects. Because of that optimization, we can reduce the amount of drug. And so I'm not gonna telegraph too much of this right now, 
but more of this data will be coming where what you're going to find is that uh, we're able to use a fraction of the amount of drug that's used uh, in equivalent treatments because of the effectiveness of how we're delivering the particular therapy. And, and the benefit, of course, is it goes back into, you could take those 10 aspirins I gave you, but it's really not going to feel good. You're going to get some side effects. I wish I could just take one-tenth of those 10. Oh, that would be one. And you can take one and it works. Well, imagine being able to take these other drugs where you're having to take so much and it's causing all these side effects. Imagine being able to take less and have the same or better outcome. You've got something really, really transformational. And that's what we're building. Again, Neopath Wellness will be launched by the end of the year. Um, it's 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 something I spend probably 90 to 95% of my time on. Here's where I get excited about it. So Neosinus Health is, is a platform for advancing drugs. And so that will generally involve clinical studies and we'll, we'll do lots of clinical studies. It also involves out licensing to pharmaceutical companies. And some people will ask me, well, you know, which pharmaceutical companies would be interested? Well, I don't know, let me think. Are any of them dealing with first pass effect uh, systemic circulation to organs, blood-brain barrier. Oh, that would be all of them. So, so yes, any of them are potential targets and partners for us to work with to optimize their clinical studies, to optimize the effectiveness of their drugs. Oh, and if their drugs failed, maybe we can recover them. It wasn't drugs' fault. It was all the, the impedance, and we can help you get around that. So there's a whole world of clinical studies and rapid advancement we're going to take, uh, which is exciting. Neopath Wellness very, very clear, is a telehealth-based service model that is able to work now. There is no clinical study. The drug has been approved. It's been out into the market. It's been used for many, many decades, children, adults, uh, everyone in between. And we're simply combining that with our novel delivery device to optimize, again, the effectiveness of that by reducing the amount of drug and therefore eliminating some of the side effects as well. And we're going to just start rolling. You know, we're going to do the first uh, therapeutic. We're going to do another one and another one, and, and we're going to just keep going. But what I get so excited about that is that that's now. And, and listen, I've had this idea of doing this Neopath Wellness. We didn't always have the name, but conceptually being able to take these drugs that have already been approved, that are off patent and combine them. I, I And the entire team, we've always known this was there, but it got to a point, quite frankly, where it was so hard to, I felt unsettled. It was like, listen, you know, can we go through a clinical study? Sure. Will it take three to five years and hundreds of millions of dollars? Probably. Um, okay. Are there people suffering today? Yeah. Like today, like in a bad way. Right. And so how can I sit here knowing that there's this little side pathway to get around the coin maze, like, why am I not doing that? Listen, there are people who are suffering right now, and, and we're going to come right out of the gates and treat depression, anxiety, PTSD, um, treatment-resistant depression, chronic pain, and, and a host of other illnesses that are just extraordinarily debilitating, affecting so many different people. And we're going to do that, like, right out of the gates with a proven, known therapeutic. Uh, and it's just going to be incredibly exciting. Uh, the leadership team I have that's going to be running that has a very extensive history of administering this therapeutic over 15,000 times uh, more than anyone and seeing the profound effects of that therapeutic that they know is now going to be further optimized. So it was already amazing when they were using it. Now it has truly tremendous potential many, many, many times over. And I always tell them, I'm not joking. I tell them I am jealous because listen, uh, I've worked with some great people and built some great companies and, and won industry awards, you know. Okay, that's cool. I guess that's nice, right? But listen, I have not, I haven't, I have not saved someone's life. They have saved people's lives. Uh, they had people who had a shotgun in their mouth several days before and they recovered. They had a mom who was going to hang herself on a Friday. The son saw the noose Thursday night, brought the mother in, healed. And, you know, wow. on and on and on and on. And this particular therapeutic has so much potential. 
But there are challenges with existing products of how to deliver that. And that's the opportunity that we have. So that's why I get so excited is right out of the gates, whether it's, you know, and, and so many different people are suffering, but whether it be a, a veteran, active military, first responder, health professional, um, s- sports figure, these are all very, very high stress jobs. You know, that's, that's like obvious, but then there's the rest of the planet, right? <laughs> right. That are also struggling with all these neurological and oh, by the way, um, this was also, you know, amplified um, and exacerbated because of uh, COVID. So I talked to a, a renowned, uh, one of the top psychiatrists in the world, wrote some of the depression protocols. Um, and I talked to him probably just as um, COVID was coming out. So maybe three to five months into COVID. And he said to me, and he was so dead right. He said, listen, um, I've seen this before. I've seen this a few times with pandemics, global pandemics. He goes, here's the problem. Here's the elephant in the room. Are people going to uh, uh, die? Hands down. Very, very bad. Is it going to be global economic impact? Absolutely, hands down. Here's the biggest problem, though. Neurological. Neurological implications. He said, you'll see this at 10 times the scale of the initial impact of COVID. It'll be 10x in the last for decades and decades and decades. And he's right. Because guess what? Guess what? (laughs) How does SARS-CoV-2, which produces COVID-19, how does it get into your body? Not through your elbow, through your nose. Oh, yes, your nose is your inlet to your body. Your nose is your AC filter that filters out the biologics and the impurities and the allergens and viruses. And guess what? Um, It comes in this way. It hits the respiratory. Respiratory, which means respiration. That's how it gets into your lungs. Um, olfactory, skull base. Oh, that would be the skull near your brain. Yep. <laughs> and, and those viruses are very, very good at guess what? Bypassing the blood brain barrier. And so that's how they're getting into your body from a respiratory standpoint. It's also how it's getting into your body from a lo- neurological standpoint, which is why people experience and will for decades. And that's what they call long, long COVID, right? They're going to continue to experience neurological implications because of COVID because it has penetrated your brain. And that's going to be a, a, a big, big problem is a reason why one of the symptoms of COVID is lack of taste and lack of smell. Olfactory, olfaction right there is because it's SARS-CoV-2 is actually um, uh, adversely affecting <laughs> that, that particular region, which, by the way, directly connects into your brain, right? And so there's a there's a huge challenge associated with that. The the level of neurological implication is is from a I'll call it from a physiological. So what I just described was a physiological implication of COVID. How about the social implication of COVID? Right, being locked up, stuck in our rooms, not interacting with people like we have before, lost our jobs. I mean, on and on and on and on. Right, and so there's just there is so much depression and anxiety. Sadly, that was already there. And now it's just amplified and exacerbated because of the global pandemic and you have global wars, you got global economic implications. I mean, it's just, it's a really, really difficult time, but there are therapies coming. Uh, We're not alone. There are a lot of some, a lot of great companies that are trying so hard and they've always been trying hard. It's not like they're not trying. There's something called the body and the blood brain barrier working against them, unfortunately. Right. And, and uh, as exciting as a, maybe a new class of these, you know, psychedelics that people often refer to are, I mean, that's great, right? But unfortunately, just because it's a magical little blue mushroom from the Amazon rainforest doesn't mean it's going to make your body remove itself of all these physiological impedance. They've been there since the beginning of time, and they're not going anywhere anytime soon until we're all mechanical metal robots, right? And so... That's not going to help either. It's not changing anything, but at least companies are trying. You know, we're certainly trying really hard, and we're just beyond excited, as I think you can tell, for what we're going to be able to do. And and I'm looking forward to the to the day that I can help the first patient, like tangibly have someone speak to me and say, "Thank you, Don. Thank you, Neosinus. Thank you, Neopath, for what you've done. You've changed my life." That's I I just want one story like that. But I know we're on the pathway to do this thousands, tens of thousands, millions, tens of millions, and even hundreds of millions of times. I do know that. Um, sadly, that's the demand. 
and, and we have, you know, a treatment and a response to that demand. So it's just hugely exciting time for us. You know, and speaking of Neoscience Health, you said, quote, the entire team is working so hard each day to make a real difference in the world. And I could not be more proud of them and more excited about the future for so many people that are suffering, unquote. You referenced this just a few minutes ago. Tell us, you know, a little bit about that team. Yeah. So, um, well, you've definitely done your homework because I remember that particular that was embedded. in I think one of my posts uh, a, a while back. So, you know, kudos. Maybe you should work for uh, the FBI or CIA. <laughs> Well, maybe you do. Maybe there's a different reason you have me on this call. <laughs> I don't know, but um, but uh, you know, great great job. So listen, um, we've been very very intentional with this team, um, and you know, I'm a straight shooter. Uh, I'm a relatively blunt person, right? I don't really mince words, so to speak. And so, um, I was speaking. I was doing a keynote at uh, John Hopkins years ago, pre-COVID. And this was a combined uh, medical school, business school, and engineering school. And so there were doctors and scientists and all that. And, and so I'm generally presenting, you know, the future of technology and technological transformation and, and digital health and digital medicine, and, you know, blah, blah, um, which is kind of painting the picture of the, the out of the possible, right? And then um, what I'll have is I call it my no BS slide. I literally label it my no BS slide. And I'll say, listen, so that's all great, but we've got to be worried about impedance, right? And it's kind of like drug delivered, right? There's impedance, right? That's a problem. Well, there's a problem if you can't bring a lot of these solutions to the market. Well, in my slide, what I'll say is, listen, you may have heard these theoretical constructs. It's the technology adoption life side. It's a macroeconomic blah, blah, right? All this kind of business academic terms, right? The theoretical constructs that will describe this. I say, listen, this is actually very simple. And I go way out on a limb here. Uh, and I and I challenge people. I say I can explain every failure anywhere in the world for anything, any industry. I can I can explain every one of those failures. And it comes to one of four things: greed, ego, ignorance, or bureaucracy. Challenge yourself. Greed, ego, ignorance, bureaucracy. And it's often multiple. So think of any failure. It could be anything. It could be a failure of a football team. It could be failure of a church. It, you know, it, just a failure of a it doesn't matter. Think of a failure. And I can assure you one of those will be clipped off. And it's usually a few of those things. The reason I bring that up to answer your question is because I've had successes in my career, hands down, but I've, I've learned far more from my failures. I tell every board I'm on, any company I advise, listen, my value to you is I've either screwed up enough, I've seen enough screwed up that I can tell you pretty much what not to do, right? And so, listen, after having been through that, you know, I'm, I'm not ready to retire, uh, but I'm also no spring chicken. And so when I left IBM, what I said to myself, well, listen, I want to use the remainder of my career, whatever's left, to make an absolute fundamental difference in the world. And what I also said was that I reflected on my experience at Millennium Pharmaceuticals, an unbelievable culture of, of hiring the best people. And the best isn't Oh, how many PhDs does he? That's not the best. The best is, do we have the right people with the right mindset, with a shared vision, with the right intention, with the right motivation, that aren't condescending, that aren't oppressing one another, that are actually working together as a team cohesively with this shared vision and shared mission to actually make a difference in the world? That's who I'm looking for, like literally hands down. And I will tell you this, if you don't conform to that, goodbye. No joke, right? Because it's incredibly important that you hire those types, those types of people. Um, and uh, sorry, had a little interruption there. Um, and so I've spent a lot of time um, really ensuring that we hired the right people to do some great things. And so if you just kind of traverse that team. So, you know, we started with the original founders, right? Um, we'll call me, I'm the business guy, the commercialization guy. Uh, Dr. Kashif Mazar, ear, nose, and throat doctor, been doing this for 15 years. Um, he's what I call my mad scientist. You know, he just has this insatiable appetite to solve problems uh, and not just turn the knob the same way and just expand, you know, definition of sanity, right? Same thing over and over again, expecting a different outcome, right. but actually actively being involved and trying to make a difference. And he's that type. And then Dr. Magda Pugh, um, she's been practicing for over 40 years. I've seen well over 100,000 patients, won top doctor awards. She just exudes patient advocacy. She exudes patient health care. 
she exudes really trying to do the right thing uh, and exudes really wanting to make a difference to help individuals one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. And so that was the original team that came in and we were the ones that really, really stepped back. They obviously had expertise in the nasal environment. We brought on Dr. Rice um, as our first a scientific advisory board member. He's a, one of the top rhinologists in the world, uh, runs out of USC. He's been on the board of every professional society you can imagine. Um, the next one is a, is a, is a renowned uh, NASA scientist. And you're like, NASA? Like, what is NASA? When, again, this is physics, right? This is fluid physics. It's fluid dynamics. It's understanding the distribution of fluids and friction and, and all kinds of certain characteristics that you have to take into consideration beyond just the anatomy, right? You got to take into consideration physics. And then the last one on the scientific advisory board is, is a very accomplished, uh, written several books, hundreds of papers on uh, nanoparticle systems. So a, a pure chemist, but expertise in nanoparticle systems. Because again, this is all about knowing the anatomy, knowing the right drugs, knowing the right nanoparticle system, combining it all end-to-end -end solution uh, to really make a difference in the world. And so those were the, I'll say that was the first initial core team. And then we started to bring on uh, additional, what I'll call clinical advisors. So, and I'm going to name them. I actually have some press releases I'm working on. So in awesome. the next in the next week or so, you actually get to meet more and more of these people. But these are scientific advisory board members uh, and clinical advisory board members that are joining us that have just raw expertise in the world of clinical care. Because in the end, I'm very comfortable with understanding the demand in the market. I'm very comfortable with knowing that we have the right potential solution, but we got to connect all those things. We got to wire it, you know, correctly. And we want to make sure that in the end, this is all about being very clinically minded, um, being, um, you know, creative with what we can do and how we can combine it. But these are all FDA approved drugs. They're very, very safe. Knowing that, knowing which ones to pick, knowing how to use those, you know, we've, we've begun to broaden that team out. So we've got, we'll call, you know, business experts, we've got clinical experts, we've got scientific experts, uh, we get physiological experts. And then we've also started to bring on some, some business consultants as well to really help from a business development standpoint to start accessing the market. These are people that are what I'll call like national spokespeople. Uh, because to me, it really is about <clears throat> understanding the market uh, understanding the particular needs of the entire population and the nuances, right? So if we talk about first responder, there's a huge area there, you know, fire, police, EMS, dispatcher. There's all kinds of subtle nuances in there that they're all struggling with that we need to understand. So we're bringing on people to help us understand that, right? Um, there's military, uh, special operations, active military, wow. veterans. So we're bringing on people who are experts in that field that have access into those domains of patient populations that need help to help all of us understand the nuances and what's the demand so we can get this right. I want to get this right. I don't want to get it wrong. I'm not going to get this damn thing wrong. I'm just simply not, right? And so I've got to get it right. And so I can't get it right myself. Uh, I'm, I'm just, I don't have that capacity, right? right? The team we have is still not enough. We got to keep growing and growing and growing the team. But We've done it very, very intentionally. Every person at the table, beyond just being capable and skilled at what they do, and this is the thing I take most pride at, is, is and I tell this to any new person coming on, I introduce them to the team and I say, listen, I can assure you with 100% confidence that any team member you meet, you're going to be like, wait a minute, wow. First of all, they're really nice. They seem very genuine. Nothing, there's no air about them. And certainly not condescending. They really are driven, very passionate. They have personal interest in doing, they seem to have a real shared vision, great chemistry, and I think I could work with them all day long. You would absolutely one by one by one all the way through conclude that. And that was not by accident at all. That was highly intentional um, because I do believe it's not the size of the team. It's not, it's not the amount. It's the quality, right? It's the focus. It's the, uh, it's the efficiency. It's the execution. If you get those things right, you can do a lot with a limited number of resources. And we've certainly proven that. And unfortunately, I'm going to have to go here in a few minutes. That's why I got interrupted. You're okay. I'm going to have to go, but... um, what are some of the long-term goals that you guys have? So our long-term vision really, um, and it's a simple way to describe it, is really to, to fundamentally improve brain health. 
overall wellness. And so that that's a ginormous marketplace. And so there's no doubt that for the next decades, we're going to be focused on just accomplishing that. Again, that's, that's, a, that's an audacious goal, but I know we can do it. There's no doubt that we can do it. And we're going to prove it very, very, very soon. And we've already proven a lot of this already with some of the existing products that we put into the market. Uh, and so we know it's possible. Uh, we're going to continue to do that. The grand vision is really to focus on the entire space of neurological and mental health disorders. And that's huge. That is, But one by one by one, either internally through clinical studies or with existing drugs that have already been approved through Neopath Wellness, rapid immediate market access, or through that clinical study, or through licensing with industry partners, we're just going to continue to just do more and more and more of those licensing deals to enable more and more pharmaceutical companies to make a bigger difference sooner. And then beyond that, remember, I just named mental health and neurological. That, that's largely brain. There's oncology, there's cardiology, there's respiratory, there's all kinds of other what, what are called disease areas that are, are ripe for using our solution as well. And so we'll continue to pursue them, but we'll probably do those through uh, partnership, partnerships and out licensing. Listen, you know, we're not going to try to boil the ocean here. We want to kind of keep as laser focused as we can, know what our, our core focus is, know where we can have the greatest impact and just hit that, you know, one after another, after another, after another, and just keep doing that. We'll certainly build lots of partnerships to access the market. This is all about making sure that the world realizes who we are and what we're able to do. So thank you, by the way. I mean, this is this is exactly, a, you know, what we're looking to do is to just get out in front of people to share our story, to share our vision, to get people equally excited. You know, people should be more excited than me because we're about to actually finally solve a huge range of clinically unmet needs that have been, you know, keeping people down um, and debilitated for decades and decades and decades. And, and, you know, it's about to improve, which is hugely exciting. And listen, we can't change everything overnight. We don't have any magical switch. We're not using magical pixie dust, right? That's not part of the equation here. So, you know, this is, this is, this is real world, right? It takes effort to, to launch, to engage, to, and we're all data driven, right? This is not just just clinical, but we're all data driven, and so we're spending a lot of time understanding exactly what we're doing and how we're doing it to further optimize. All and we again, we really have a number of levers that we can move, and this is all about studying what's working and how we can further improve and and you know utilize those levers more efficiently and effectively to make more and more of an impact over time, and we'll just continue to do that everywhere that we can reach. Last question. What are the most important lessons that you've learned in life? Um, uh, I would say one of the biggest lessons is that um, for sure, life will never play out like you think it will. Um, is as, as, as informed as you may be, um, there's no guarantee. As confident as you may be, there's no guarantee. And that makes life really, really difficult, but it also makes it exciting, right? It's like, you know, if if everything in life was A, B, and then C, A, B, and I call my hair, A, B, and C, I eat my food, A, B, everything was A, B, and C. It's just, it's like, I guess it's nice, but it's also pretty boring. And uh, I don't think life would be like it is now, right? And so because it is so dynamic and so variable, that's exciting. And so you have to embrace it because it's not changing, right? You know, there's physiological impedance. It's not changing anytime soon. So maybe stop fighting that battle, right? You know, life is not going to work your way. So maybe stop fighting that battle. Um, and so that's been my li biggest life lesson is realizing that m almost everything we deal with is outside our realm of control. You know, your only response has to be to, to adapt, uh, to learn, to move on. And, um, you know, and always try to do the right thing as best that you can. Again, I've made many, many mistakes in life for sure. But to the extent that you can, try to try to do the right thing. Surround yourself by people that have that shame, same belief system. And if they don't, remove them from the team. Instantaneously remove them from the team because that's that's not going to help the situation. And nobody nobody wins from that, right? Um, you gotta, you got to have the right team of people. Um, so that's my biggest life lesson for sure. 
you know, I talk a lot about the power of a moment. And in a lot of those moments go back to that parking lot when the guy came up to you and asked you to build the website. That's how a lot of things got started for you. That one moment right there, timing is everything. If you hadn't been walking into the parking lot at that time, who knows where life would have taken you? You have no idea. You know, I'm so happy that you, you reached out to me you know, on LinkedIn and what you guys are doing is so amazing. And I, I can't wait to see where this goes. Uh, all the great things you're going to be doing to help people, people that have been in pain for many years and despair. And you'll definitely have to come back on the show again down the road to share with us all the progress that you guys are making in the industry throughout, not only the United States, but throughout the whole world. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. Super. Thank you. I appreciate so much. you coming on. Thanks so much, Don. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Bye-bye.